Hi, I'm Liz. And I'm Rhea. Welcome to Karma's My Bitch, a podcast about love, sex, connection, abundance, joy, purpose, peace, and how life isn't simply the stories we tell ourselves. We've talked about having him on the podcast before, but we never did. And in any case, he is really one of my favorite people in all the world. Probably one of the most influential and one of my greatest teachers. It's my father. Hi. Hello, guys. How are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm really flattered that you even consider bringing me in. Are, are you a younger child? No, I'm a middle child. Had all those middle child issues that go with that too. So would you say? Would you say you still have those issues? I still had a lot of issues. <laughs> That's I what mean, I thought. My <laughs> issues have issues. <laughs> yeah, we're only going to pack a few of them today. Uh, what was the worst part of being a middle child? Being expected to, uh, well, my sister she was the oldest, so I got to do all the chores. My brother was very young he was eight years younger than i was Mm -hmm. so i got to carry most of the load and when my father got bad he would take it out on me not out on my sister who was his dimpled darling Mm -hmm. or my brother because he was too young so Mm -hmm. handy target yeah and you know you handle it in different ways oh i had this i guess you could almost call it an idyllic childhood as I look back on it, not while I was living it. But it was a small town, southeast Missouri. I mean, the biggest hill in the area was the levee. Uh, Mississippi River was a quarter of a mile from my backyard, I mean, from my back steps. So literally, I mean, it wasn't the Mark Twain, but uh, in the 50s, life civilization was a lot more it was a lot different. You know, I could ride my bike around town and not worry about anything. I could get on my bike, take my 22 of my fishing pole, and ride through town, and nobody was worried that I was going to go shoot up a school or somebody else. Not being the best student in the world, I just couldn't deal with school. So I ended up joining the Navy after I graduated. And what was it like being in the Navy? It was actually good. I mean, once you get through boot camp and you get through this training phase, it's a job. That's all the military is. It's just a job. If you're lucky, you'll get a you'll get that job that you like and want. Some people wanted to be electricians. Some people wanted to work with boilers. Some people liked to work uh, out on deck. I was uh, given a medical job. I was a corpsman, and what I—I I had no idea. You know, what I mean, I was in what the, I was in recruit training boot camp, and classification came around. It's like, what do you want to do while you're in the Navy? And I looked it up, and I go like, well, I like to work uh, paperwork. I want to be a personnelman. I want to be something that uh, works with shuffles papers and do this, do that. Okay. Why? What made you say that? Because I didn't want to work on deck. I mean, I didn't know. I didn't medical, you know. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't fast enough to be radio man. My, I didn't want to sit there with ears, ears on and have to listen for sonar pings all day long. <laughs> okay. All these different sounds. Probably would have been yeah. put to sleep, I'm sure. <laughs> I would have just fallen asleep. So the gentleman who was doing this, he wasn't much of a gentleman, but he just said, tell you what, I want to put you down for Corman and Dental Tech. You don't stand a chance of getting either one. You're not even qualified for it, which later on I found out I was more than qualified for because my test scores indicated, you know, I had high, I had a high test scores. Okay. But I ended up in the medical field. Well, I worked on wards to start out with, you know, getting patients ready for surgery. I worked on a clean surgery ward, just learning the ins and outs of the body. I had a great uh, charge nurse, uh, Lieutenant Caroline Louisa. She was really good. And she was really good at training us corpsmen for what we were going to be doing 
later on. Because all of this was just training to get us ready to go serve with the Marines in Vietnam. Wow. And, uh, but she also shoved us out into the hospital and made us work different wards. She put us down on the dirty surgery ward. And dirty surgery is when the uh, amputations from Vietnam, the explosions, and different things that would uh, expose you to what uh, some of the gore looked like. And she explained it, you know, she said, you need to go down there, look and see what these body parts, body looks like from the outside in, see the inside of this, you know. And what was it like the first time you saw it? It was pretty traumatic because I knew where I was going. I knew eventually I would end up in Vietnam with a Marine unit. And I just, you know, and you see it, you feel sorry. I felt sorry for the guys. But uh, after a while, you just kind of like, everybody's doing their job. Everybody's doing their part. And this is the end result of that. So when you got to Vietnam, what was it like? What, was it what you expected? No. When I got off the airplane, the most immediate thing that hit me was that country stinks. It was scary. I mean, I was, you know, I was afraid. But it, it only, you know, you just start getting busy and doing things. When you, you know, you realize, all right, you know, you're in it to win it. Yeah. You know, 12 months from now, I'm going to be going home. Maybe. Hopefully. But, hopefully. But, uh, well, and P.S., I did make it. So we all got in the truck, went over to the 1st Med Battalion, and this guy said, all right, wait, wait here, wait outside, we'll call you in for processing. And they kept calling everybody in, everybody in, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm the only one left outside. And I don't know how long I'm there, but, you know, it's getting close to the end of the day. And pretty soon this Navy chief comes out of the hooch, and he goes, who are you? I go, I'm a Jen Hayes. He goes, and I'm just waiting to be processed. He goes, no, you're not. I processed everybody. He goes, hmm, let me make a phone call. I was uh, scheduled to go to a, 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 mer- a letter company, what they call a letter, or anyway, a battalion of, of infantry, and my record had gotten separated. Hmm. He goes, all right, you'll sleep here tonight, and then tomorrow you you're going to two, three, second battalion, third marine. That's what I thought, but you know, I had my hopes to go. Oh wow, I'm going to be here, yeah. and then all of a sudden, no, you're not. You're <laughs> going to be there. <laughs> you know, you're going to do this, not that. People were a lot different back then. It was just, you know, you go, okay, you accepted a lot of things that you, you know. When I enlisted in the military. I had signed up to do things that civilians wouldn't have to do. I expected a certain amount. I certainly did not expect to end up, when I joined the Navy, I did not expect to end up with the Marines. Because the way my father phrased it was, a couple of days after I graduated high school, my father called me in the house. And he goes, okay. I am not going to piss off my money sending you to college. I'm going, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> so which branch of the service do you want to join? <laughs> and uh, my uncle had been in the Navy during the Korean War, and he had a lot of sea stories he was telling. I mean, you got to remember, Navy was not heavily involved in the Korean War. Yeah. You know, I just I didn't think I could be a Marine. I didn't think I'd go like, man, those guys are tough. You know, the World War II stories and... Mm-hmm. All this, I'm going like, I ain't John Wayne. I do not enjoy a good fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had plenty of them, though. I had, bit, I had them, but I just didn't enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all drunken fights. I was going to say, maybe you were of sober. Were <laughs> if if I'd been story. sober, I probably wouldn't have been into it. <laughs> good point. But, you know, being an alcoholic at from age 13. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the Navy just sounded good. You know, yeah. three hots and a cot, everything else. And then it turns out that, uh, no, you're going to do your first sea duty tour with the Marines, and you're going to do it in Vietnam. So I'm going, all right. I enlisted. Nobody, you know, I wasn't drafted. So, you know, this is what you got yourself into. You, you're going to do, you're going to finish what you started. 
And I'm going, all right, let's go. It wasn't fun, but it was, uh, I look back on it, and I think it was one of the best years of my life. I come back to it, I hate to say it, you know, I made some good friends and I lost a lot of good friends, but I got a lot out of it. Be surprised what you can do and can't do and what you will do when things happen. And the Marines around me were good. They, they tried, you know, they realized what a dumbass I am and they did everything they could to train me to. So I only got the one purple heart and that was enough. Yeah. But it went bad and ended up walking from Da Nang all the way into the DM, or to the DMZ and then back, halfway back. So then it was over. When it was over, I got sent to New Orleans. For me, when I hear best, I hear growth. Like I grew, you know. That, that's pretty much change. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you realize I, I. You see where I get it from, though, where I'm yeah. like. Oh, this is going to be hard and challenging. Yeah. It'll be a great experience. Yeah. And you're hearing, like, that'll be the worst moment of my life. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but it's life-changing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely was. I, and that's, I guess that's what I meant. It took me out of my lazy and then indolent little uh, life. Well, not lazy, but indolent. You know, where I was always protected. I was always taken care of in one form or another. Either my parents giving me a roof or the Navy giving me meals and a paycheck and this and that to actually go out and earn that paycheck now. And to do something, I grew up around World War II veterans and Korean veterans. And the World War II ones, they were, they're the ones who taught me about honor, about patriotism, about love of country, and caring for your fellow man. They're the ones who taught me that. But I never learned it until I went to Vietnam. I knew the words and I knew, you know, compassion. I knew about this and that. Those were words. When you're the medical person responsible for 20 Marines' lives, you know, and health, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're walking along and it's bang, crash, boom, bam. And then they call Corman up and that's you. It's your responsibility. But then it's not a responsibility. It's become something, it's more than a job. I can't really explain it, but that's your buddy out there. And that's your job. His job was to do whatever it is. My job is to make sure that he goes home. I didn't even think about going out there. It just, I went. So I didn't think about it. It's just, and that's why, because you just, there was a fellowship camaraderie and you develop it and you don't even realize it it's just something that happens that's why i've never watched really watched a, a war movie or anything else i was else. gonna ask yeah. no you mean the ones set in vietnam ones in, yeah ones in vietnam but i used to watch the war movies you know the mm -hmm. john wayne humphrey bogart all these movies and everything else and i just couldn't do it anymore but the one thing that the movies can't bring, they got the bangs and the booms and then this, they can't bring the smell. It's different. And you're different. I don't think uh, nobody ever survives war. The person, when the first, when that bullet goes off, the first round's fired, everything else, the person that you were for that is now dead because it changes you and it changes you a lot. You know, some people say, nah, but it does. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and in my opinion, anybody who's ever been to war, they died because they're no longer that person that they were. As much as you want to be, you're not, you're not ever going to be that person ever again. I could be standing between two Marines and we look at the same event but we react differently. And it's not because I'm a medical person or, and they're Marines who are supposed to do, you know, the fixed bayonet and up the hill thing. But it's just because it's an individual thing. You know, I grew up in small town America. I had guys from the ghettos in Philly. I had, uh, 
a buddy from East St. Louis. If you don't know what East St. Louis is, it's a tough place. You know, East St. Louis, Illinois, because it's across the river. So everybody comes into your life from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you and Rhea, you know, totally different. You know, little Miss Helen in California, Miss London. London, <laughs> you know. So, you know, I'm from New Madrid. This guy's from Philly. Next guy's a farm boy from North Carolina. Mm. You know, machine gutter. That's the funny thing. His last name was Hayes. Mm. No relation. Yeah. So it's just a, it's a reaction. It's how you live with it and how you can. And some people do well. Some people don't do well at all. Hence the PTSD, the homeless, the drug addicts. Some people who are borderline, mentally ill, now are pushed over the edge. So... I think it might be a good time to share a particular story, if you can recall it in detail, which was when you were in Vietnam and you were injured and you swear that there was probably some guardian angel who saved you from dying. Yeah, that. Okay. Uh, We were retaking a building. It's the first day at Tet of 68 and we're retaking a village. Oh, okay. Wait. We'd already been chased out once. They had uh, counterattacked, this and that. We got pulled back to regroup, so we were going back in. We got to a certain area, and I'm sitting there, (laughs) I'm kneeling in a uh, cabbage patch. A lot of cover there. (laughs) (laughs) But to my left, there's a cinder block building with a uh, thatch roof. I hear a a gunshot, AK round. It was a crack. So the AK round, neck followed by Corman up immediately, Corman up. And so I started running, and I could run back then. So I'm running, and then I hear uh, somebody yell, for God's sakes, Doc, get down. And I broke stride. I turned around, looked over my right shoulder to see who said that. I don't know why I did that. Because, uh, see, it would be in one alpha over there, squad. As I'm turning back around, my head's down, and I see the explosion, or what I later realized is an explosion. It's black, orange, dirty, and I see the white. And the white's the shrapnel as it flies by. And it just turns me around, slams me into the side of the building. If I hadn't broken stride, I would have been right there in the middle of that explosion anyway I wounded uh, eventually get medevac so I make my way back to the company a few weeks later and I talked to everybody and for nobody heard that nobody said anything everybody in that squad over there denies it they said yeah well I saw you running but you're running there was no particular reason so but yeah, I distinctly heard, for God's sakes, Doc, get down. My right leg, if not both legs, would have been really messed up. Yeah, it gave me some pause. I was very thankful. I was very thankful for the whole thing. How did you re- reconcile that, being able to go back? It was my job. Okay. And as I, you know, I jokingly said, I want to go home. Mm. Yeah, I did. But you don't. You can't. You know, you're going to serve your time. You're going to get mutilated or your dad or you'll serve your time that's how you're going home and we all knew it you know and it was just something you did you know it, it, it's it's a certain thing that it just happens I, I'm not sure I can't explain it but you enlisted and now where you're at you have to be willing to put yourself in danger I guess or put yourself out there because that's what you signed up for in one form or another. I mean, I didn't sign up to go get shot at. I signed up to be on a ship. I didn't know anything about Marine Corps. You know, I thought Marine Corps was the Marine Corps, but it's what you did. You just have to be able, you know, somebody says, stand up, move forward and you do it. I mean, because that's what you Signed signed up for. How does one go through a year like that and then cope? 
Yeah. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. But the first time I ever got drunk, I had a blackout. But I woke up from the blackout while I was still drinking, and I was at this party. And so for me, the rest of my life was, if I could remember everything I did, I wasn't drunk. If I could remember, I wasn't drunk just because I was stumbling, yeah. mumbling. But that's just the way it was. And I didn't realize it until later on. Some before I went to high school is when I started drinking and everything. I was in two car, uh, alcohol-related car wrecks that summer. Wow. I turned 14 just as I was going in, as I started mm-hmm. my freshman year. But I assume when you came back, Oh yeah, Vietnam. That yeah. was kind of how you coped with. And I was in New Orleans. I got <laughs> there just in time to learn my way around a little bit, and then Mardi Gras hit. Oh, wow. oh my God, that was fun. Yeah, it was very interesting. Good times. Well, can I? Um, I can also just bring up that your father and his father. You come from a line of alcoholics. I come from a long line of alcoholics. Yeah, my father was an abusive alcoholic. And oddly enough, uh, I had no desire to be anything like him. I had no desire. And then remarkably, how close I did come to being like him, very similar to him. You know, I I never hit my wife or anything else. I mean, but verbally abusive. And then, uh, all right, the redemption part is, one day I got a set of order. I was coming off uh, my first ship. And my orders were to the East Coast from San Diego. I had three children. My wife goes, I'll tell you what, you write often and visit when you can. I'm not taking our three kids to the East Coast where in 10 minutes you'll find a bar and have a hundred good friends and then I'm gonna have to find, you know, start all over again learning my way around with the three kids, which caused me to start evaluating everything because then that's, that was the moment I realized I love my kids more than anything else. You know, if my wife wanted to leave, bye, but I don't want to lose my children. I love my kids. See, I was in 79. So Elizabeth would have been three, mm-hmm. this and that. And I absolutely adored my kids. So I signed up for alcohol rehab and quit drinking. Makes it sound easy, doesn't it? I know. I was like, okay, well, that was overnight. What? <laughs> no, I mean, it, was, it wasn't easy. Uh, I mean, I didn't have any withdrawals to go through or any of that, but it was just a determination to not lose my children. I mean, they may not have been, you know, I may not have been the happy, loving father, but they meant the world to me. Probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Uh, if my wife walked out the door, I'm not sure I would have uh, cared, not cared that much. But if she took my children, that would have been devastating to me, period. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I kind of started getting my sobriety. It took a long time, but I started getting it. Uh, went to the rehab, six weeks, this and that. And, you know, they were always, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you, you know the programs you have to go through, you know the steps you have to take to maintain your sobriety, this and that. The only thing I did, I, <laughs> I used my kids again. <laughs> I used my children. <laughs> no, I never went, uh, once I got out of rehab, I never went back to, uh, I'd, I never did do another AA meeting or anything else. My children were my crutch, and I kept them as close, kept them as close as I could. Okay, <laughs> they were they, they were everything because. Well, I mean, it's the because, idea. I, I tell you what, you know, I look back on it now, and I realize that because of Vietnam, or maybe it was just personality defect. I don't know which one it was. I had no friends. I had a whole bunch of people that I knew, but I had no friends. And even the one person I considered to be a friend was nothing but a drunk like me. Mm. And 
so once you know I started growing up, you know, just because him and my kid, you know, his kids, my kids played together, and la da 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 da. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just going like, I'm done with this. Leave me alone. I just I want my kids. Yeah, that was it. I mean, I'm just saying, ironic. It's more the idea because you were still geographically away most of the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's the physical the reality of your part. children. That was the other part. But we weren't there because you were. I mean, we weren't together because you were gone most of the time. Yeah. But also, I was. I had to unpack that in a different way. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's all fair yeah. because that was the part of. Let me ask you this then: When I was coming home from deployment, did you dislike the fact I was coming home? No, no, no. I was always really excited. Okay, because when my father come home off the river, my sister and I, we were physically ill. We despised him. Mm. We did not want him to come home at all. Mm. You're right. I wasn't much of a father, but when I was there, I was. I tried a little bit. Didn't. Yeah, and I never accused. I never felt your absence. All I'm saying is that when you used us as a bit of a crutch, I'm like. That was also the idea of us, not necessarily the physical presence because we weren't often together. Correct. Right. Yeah. And that yeah. was... I was just clarifying. And that was that part, <laughs> and that, was that, part that uh, when I went back into the Navy, so I got out after my first enlistment mm-hmm. and I went back home. I was in no better shape than I was when I joined the Navy the first time. I was flat broke. I had no prospects. And the only thing I, you know, and so I was sitting at Rosie's Bar and Cafe one afternoon having a beer and a shot when I happened to look up and at the other end of the bar was my father and one of his buddies. And I looked at that and I'm going like, fuck, I'm not much but I'm, this is sad. <laughs> I'm out of here. And so the next day, I went and re-enlisted because <laughs> I was, you know, I go like, all right. But then that's when I said, that's it. I'm going to do 20 and I'm, you know, I'm going to have something other than just this. Mm-hmm. And I tried. So. Yeah. And that's when you went off to New Orleans. You re no. Oh, no. That was I, I just went. Back to Cape Girada, Missouri, saw the recruiter. No, that's what I mean. But after you re-enlisted is when I went to the Philippines. <laughs> Which brings me on to my next question. <laughs> Philippines. Philippines. I'm, I've always, yeah, I've always been really curious about this. How you met Liz's mom? I was assigned to the naval base, Subic Naval Station Clinic. It was the medical clinic. And uh, there was a guy who, uh, another corpsman, another third class, and he was uh, madly, passionately in love with Cynthia, a girl that he met. She worked on base, but Cynthia's father was very Filipino, traditional. Cynthia was a very beautiful girl. She was very attractive. And But Fred was just head over heels in love with her. Oh. Oh my God, true love, if there ever was. And, you know, I guess she loved, I don't know, she loved him too. But uh, Cynthia had a friend in town who's new in town. But anyway, for Fred to go on the date, he had to get somebody to go date this other girl as a date for the other girl. So I wasn't really interested. And he goes, okay, well, I'll buy the beer. I go, okay, I'm on. I'm yeah. in. I'm Listen, in. we have a beer and stop drinking. <laughs> I'm in. Exactly. I'm in. Yeah, I haven't been to rehab yet. <laughs> we, we're heading there, but I'm not there yet. So, and I've already learned to love San Miguel. Oh, my God, it was good. I like my San Miguel. Yeah. So not for, to be confused with the current San Miguel that oh, is no, no, coming you, out of Spain. It is different. It's Filipino San Miguel. It, it has to be in the Philippines, in the brown bottle, with the painted label. Yeah. Anyway, so went on the blind date, and I met this girl. She was nice. I mean, she was nice, very standoffish, very aloof, but she was nice. Got out of her, you know, three years of college, 
We chit-chatted pretty much most of the night. Found out she worked as a cashier in a store. Off and on, I would see her. Nothing, you know, you couldn't, there had to be a chaperone. You know, this was not the bar girls or any of these other things, you know. I mean, it was all very strict back then, you know, because uh, the town of Long I mean, there was, you know, God bless America, you know, set up a, an entire whorehouse right outside the gate <laughs> and then try to blame the other people for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the local, yeah. But anyway, uh, that was just the customs of the time. But we kind of fudged a little bit. We got to know each other. We met it uh, a couple of times. Went to parties out on the beach, and she was there. We just got to know each other. Now, don't get me wrong. I was I was running the streets. I was I hit the bars, and I was you know one of the good time Charlies. But it seemed like I was always kind of gravitating back to her, you know, just to have a... It was almost like civilization, in, you know, it was like civilization in, inside of this jungle. So I, I grew to have feelings. And then uh, just one day out of the blue, I said, would you marry me? Really? Yeah. And she said, yeah, I guess. Did she really say, yeah, I guess? No. I didn't think so. She doesn't seem like that type of person. No. Because how long had you been, when I say this in air quotes, seeing each other? <laughs> Getting to about a year. Getting to about a year. About a year. Okay. Yeah. And I, I realized, you know, she was in her third, you know, her, her third year of college. And she went to her father and it was one of these, well, time to go back. Got some money here. And he goes, eh, kind of on hard times right now. So I think I'm just going to send your brother back. And you'll have to have, I don't know, you'll, you're going to have to take some time off from college. Mm. And she's going like, um, what? <laughs> so she left home. Her older sister had uh, was married. Nats went down to uh, Longapo. She had to get out of town, you know. And she did that a lot, and uh, you guys were both kind of very, runaways. It was yeah, very funny. Even when she was a little kid, she would just get on a bus or whatever and go to her grandmother. It was, and it wasn't an easy trick going from Goa to Manat now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, she'd have to take the bus, take a ferry, <laughs> canoe or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't up the street and around the corner. <laughs> no. It's definitely something in, in, in my bloodline. People really yeah. like to, we like to run away. We yeah. like to, we like our freedom. We like to travel. I think of the alcoholic's way of uh, trying to settle down also. Yeah. You know, I'm being this, then, huh, you know, I'm expected mm-hmm. to do this. And so I did that. Were you aware at the time, like, was, was there any awareness around your drinking and the amount you were drinking that oh maybe i have an issue or we weren't there yet no i definitely was not there the world had the problem not me i was a functional alcoholic i was very good at my work mm-hmm. i mean i was given some duties that you know other people weren't given and this and that hmm. so and now, do you ever drink at all or not at all? I do. I drink a uh, glass of wine here, a glass of wine there. I feel buzz. I haven't gotten drunk. And I, I'm, not, I'm not using the blackout as yeah. the... <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit more aware. Of, but uh, no, I just, you know, I, I feel a buzz and I quit. Or did you have to stop completely for a while? I stopped for about three years, maybe four uh, because after I finished rehab, I was on shore duty for three years. Mm. And then I went to a year-long school that I actually stayed awake for. I don't know why. I don't know if it's just coping mechanism I developed from when I was little, but I never missed you. And I don't know if it's because I knew you'd come back. But I don't miss people when they leave. I find leaving easy. You know, even though you write to your kids and everything else, your family... You know, to hear their voices 
and you know people only put so much into a letter I mean obviously <laughs> you don't know how much they've grown and how much they've uh, advanced during that time even though you, you get the letters and you have this sense of everything's okay but to talk to you you know is one thing to see your face and see that emotion that you know you project the sincerity and the uh, mm -hmm. comedic uh, relief and the smile mm -hmm. and you know especially when it's somebody you really care about mm -hmm. you know and you hear them using words that weren't there six months ago mm -hmm. or seven months ago depending on how your mother counted her husband's deployment <laughs> she had some weird math on that i know <laughs> we're still discussing that <laughs> yeah here we are 52 years later her, uh, her math was her own coping mechanism yeah though, right and would right make it shorter or longer it would seem a bit longer like it would shorten it in her like mentally but then i think number wise it almost came out longer <laughs> Does it that was. make sense? Yeah, it did to me because I'm still confused. Yeah, because I, I, think, I, lived I think the day you left was never counted. It was always the, it, I think it was the day after. Yeah, and you're coming home in, in December. It doesn't matter if it's December 31st. December still, <laughs> December, yeah, yeah. it could have been the first. <laughs> yeah, I think she was the one who probably suffered the most, not just having to take care of kids on her own, but it's the in and out when you're home and then you leave because there's such a massive adjustment. Mm. I feel that way when Ricardo goes, like when he, well, when they were younger, more, less, really probably no change now, but it was always having to like make space and yeah. then figure out what to do with that space once they leave. But there was and never an illusion between your mother and I in that before or after I asked her to marry me, I told her I'm in the Navy and, you know, you're going to be, you know, more or less, you're going to be a Navy wife. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe I have to deploy, maybe I have to do this. So there's just times you're on your own. When the rubber hit the road, I'm going to tell you something. That, that woman really lived up to, you know, cope with it as best she could. Mm -hmm. Because her family was in the Philippines. I mean, it wasn't that long, a couple of years. You know, Chris was born and then, God, I don't even think it was a year when her mother passed away. I couldn't even get her back to the Philippines for the trip. But whether she was sick, ill, or injured, it was on her. Because my family, even though they were in Missouri, they were not going to do anything. They had their own lives. And they were not going to come out to California and help their sailor son, brother, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just remember my mother going like, yeah, you want to have kids, have kids. Don't expect me to be your babysitter. And so, you, you said the same thing to me. <laughs> yeah, but I was. I lived through a lot of uh, changes in the military. There was a, so many changes. You go from a wartime military to the peacetime, and not only that, but then you go from the draft to no draft. And so it was all volunteer force. Wasn't bad. Odd characters in there, though. I mean, that, that I could just make a whole podcast out of some of the head cases that came into the military during the Carter years, cat fives. So anyway, survived through all that. We went, th made it through the Carter years and then the glory years of Reagan, you know, built up the military, you know, gave us our pride back. But in the military, you have certain pay raises that come and it's automatic. You know, when you get to 20 years, the last big pay raise is at 26, 26 years. I was at E8, made it to 26, got that big pay raise, and then Clinton got elected. And that's when I said, I'm out of here. I'm done. Military cuts are coming. So shortly after that, I just put it in my year. I, I retired in 93. I went in in July of 66, and I retired in October of 93. Wow. Do you then get a pension from the... I do. But there's also the wear and tear on the body. So I went to the VA, disabled, and I've got a 90%. You went up to 90. I'm up to 90%. 
I finally forced myself to go see a psychiatrist. I started that process. It, it's not that easy. But before I got to see the psychiatrist, I saw a psychologist. And that's when she goes, wow. <laughs> when your psychiatrist or psychologist goes, wow. <laughs> you, are, you are messed <laughs> up. <laughs> Can I, what a mess. <laughs> what does 90% mean? Uh, 90% disability it means you're pretty damn broken. Biggest problem was... You know, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Well, we both worked, my, uh, Nats and I both worked. And that worked out because I worked during the day and then she worked at night. So we would see each other infrequently. But now we're both retired. <laughs> and that's not as easy as you think it is, gang. <laughs> no. You know, especially when you have two, I don't want to say type A personalities because it's just more... Two people who are always right. Yeah. Well, you guys are also very independent in your own ways. Yeah. And I think that's what yeah. suffers a lot. It is. Because now it's like, where are you going? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> oh, upstairs. He goes, well, can you do this first? <laughs> Sometimes it's just a lot to not go out for that proverbial pack of cigarettes one day. Aside being an alcoholic, he was also a lifelong smoker who also started at 13. So 13 was a pivotal year. Yeah. You know, for Jews, you have your bar and bat mitzvah. Yeah. For my father, you know, his awakening was alcohol and cigarettes. Yeah, I never thought about the bar mitzvah thing. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> some people have bar mitzvahs, some people have confirmation. <laughs> Some people just get drunk. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, my sister taught me how to smoke. My father taught me how to drink. My sister taught me how to smoke. <laughs> I miss smoking so much. I would get, I would kill for a cigarette right now. I quit smoking because my wife was going to retire. And I did not want to argue every day, all day, about a cigarette. And so that's why I quit. Really, that's the reason you That's the reason I quit. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> that's why <laughs> the other health factor it was like I had nothing to do with it I'm 74 right mm -hmm. yeah all right i'm 74 <laughs> and uh you know i never thought i'd make it this far yeah well clearly <laughs> i'm very happy and content with my life mm -hmm. you know well no i'm not i'm not really happy and content i'm satisfied mm -hmm. but you know happiness and Contentment for me, see, it, it again, individualized. Mm -hmm. It's all individual. It's what makes you happy. What would make me happy is sitting on my patio with a pack of cigarettes and a beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or in the Philippines on the beach with a San Miguel because yeah. I can't get the real San Miguel anywhere else. If you're going to sin, sin. Go, <laughs> if you're going in, go big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're in in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. That's, I've just never, the fake stuff just never got it. One thing we never really addressed was your disillusionment. I mean, I'm the spiritual one here in the, the spiritual side of the podcast, which was at some point, the whole God thing. Uh, I mean, after everything you've been through and having gone from Catholic school onward and your issue with the nuns, like something that he didn't really touch on, but... Where are we at now? You know, when I was a kid, I was raised to be a Catholic. And I could never get with the program. But I was also in a family that you could not question it. So if I was to question it, I would have received the beating of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of kept my mouth shut to a point. Went to Mass, did, I, did, I, did all these things I was supposed to do. And then when I left, I'm going, like, okay, at least I don't have to go to church anymore. And then when I went to Vietnam, that's where my question about God came in. And it exists to this day. Because mm -hmm. what kind of a God allows... I had a friend. We had mail call. He found out he was a father. He had a baby girl was born. That night, he was killed. Mm -hmm. What kind of God allows that kind of shit? Mm -hmm. Going up a hill, he disappears in a blast just big brown smoke the only thing left is a boot and so a shirt floating in the wind because the border round landed right on him mm. you know and then you see you know because it started out down south around the name 
and there was, you know, you see the civilian population. What kind of a God allows that shit to happen? You know, the NBA goes through an orphanage with flamethrowers. You know, and that kind of shit. No. I, I, so, you know, I kind of question that. Nobody's, you know, well, God works in mysterious ways. Well, no shit. You know, maybe he shouldn't. Hmm. Maybe he should quell some of that stuff. Hmm. You know, the stuff that happens in every war. You know, I'm sure it happened in Iraq. I'm sure it happened in Afghanistan. You know, all of these things happen in that kind of thing. Man's inhumanity to man. You know, if you're a woman in Iraq, what happens to you? If you're a woman in Afghanistan, what kind of life can you expect? None of that's right. And I'm not just, you know, not, you know, I mean, come on, try to be a transgender in, you know, uh, Alabama. You know, that's not easy. You know, nothing of it is. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be, you know, a human being's a human being, you know. I think we need to do better. Mm -hmm. We need to do better, but if there is a God, someone's better show up. Him or her better show up. And I, I, and I'm sorry to get on my soap opera about that. But, no, but it was more that, you but, know. You know, I just saw so many men, women, and children. You know, that Vietnam really... It was a defining moment, so there was a lot, a lot, of, a lot of questions asked too. So I mm. still don't have the answer for. So you were the first person I think I ever met who said that they were agnostic, and I think that's always stayed with me as well because I, you know, I think as, you, as a parent, you well, when a parent says that to you, you think okay, especially because you guys threw me into Catholic schools. So I thought, okay, well, I have a father who says he's agnostic. Why am I in a Catholic school? Yeah, the mother okay. thought she was a saint. Yes, exactly. You guys balanced each other. <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't sure. I actually wasn't sure where you were now at 74, where, where, where your belief system was. Because, you know, if you have a daughter who does what she does, you like your pocket full of crystals. He does have crystals in his car. He's a man of contradictions. <laughs> yeah, in some respects we all are. But it takes a, a real person to come out, admit it, and then live their lives like that. You know, you're to be congratulated that you can live your own life. If you could give anyone listening peace or pieces of advice to your grandchildren, your children, the next generations that you've learned that you feel would somehow be lost because your experience is so different from the generations that come, what well, would it be? Live the life that you want, but make sure it's the life that you want. Don't live somebody else's version of your life. I mean, I've done that, and it's, it's a very uncomfortable... It's not... No, live your life the way you choose to live it. Don't harm anybody, but just, you know, live your life the way you want to live it, period. Mm -hmm. And that's also part of that. Make sure you live the life that you choose to live. But there's consequences for that. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to take those consequences. If you don't quit drinking, I'm going to take the kids and leave you. Mm -hmm. You know, so I compromise and I quit. Do you regret quitting? No, not at all. I'm not sure I want to get drunk ever again. Mm -hmm. I like my buzz, <laughs> but I don't want to get drunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's a very uncomfortable feeling, and you're not in control. Mm -hmm. It's like the drugs. You know, I've never done drugs. I don't know why. I had access to it. <laughs> Certainly I had access to it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for some reason, I just never did drugs. You know, and, you know, for people who have drug problems or addicted to drugs, I feel bad for them, really bad, because mm -hmm. I know what it's like to try to quit smoking. To say, live the life that you want to make sure you want it. That's what we preach, of course, but it's not that easy. It's not. And I think if you're target, if you're, if you're also, if you're sharing that with younger generations who are much more able to do it, yet seem to struggle all the same, I think, well, what more could we offer? What more can we say to yeah, them? Because I know you got more in you. <laughs> Take responsibility 
for your actions or inactions. I mean, my children, when they left home, had to know how to wash clothes. They know how to iron them. They had to know how to cook. I didn't want them starving to death, and for God's sake, they're going to stink up the world. You know, they have to be able to take care of themselves and not have to rely on someone else to do it. But again, responsibility is you, you know. When you go off to college or if you go somewhere, whatever it is, you know, mommy and daddy's not going with you. What's next? Retirement. I want to enjoy my grandchildren, my children. I want to travel. That's the big thing. I wonder what's my DNA scatter. (laughs) (laughs) Out to the universe. (laughs) I'm very proud of my children, and I'm proud all three of my children. I'm excited for my five grandchildren, the opportunities that they have in front of them. And uh, because they're parents, they're able to provide for them, and they seem to love them. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And if you enjoyed any of my father's stories, he does have a blog. Okay, interesting. Yeah, on Medium. It's called War Cigarettes in San Miguel. So he tells a lot of tales from his time in Vietnam and well, pre and post, which are really interesting. So some details in there and insights about life and death. And will you come back on the podcast again one day? I will. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. Thank you for listening. For more information, articles and inspiration, find us at karmasmybitch.com and at karmasmybitch.insta. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review.